Thank you all for coming. I'm Les from New Mexico, USA. I've been in Second Life since sometime in mid-2008. I've been fortunate enough to make many great friends and consider myself blessed because of it. I find SL to be very therapeutic and it is the main social interaction that I have in any life. Thank you, Linden Lab. I have been living with a disability for 20 years, but that's okay. Thanks to doctors and friends, both in real life and second life, I'm doing okay. In real life, I'm disabled from the medical field. Oops, excuse me. I was able to have two great careers before I eventually became unable to work. Since then, one of the things I cherish about Second Life is that it has made me feel productive again. Feeling productive is great for the health of anyone, disabled or not, so I thank you, Linden Lab, for this great forum. I am retired, disabled from the medical field, and most of my time is spent taking care of my mother. She was diagnosed three years ago with liver disease, so we both sort of take care of each other. Here in SL, I enjoy sailing and flying. I'm also a very proud member of the Second Life Coast Guard. We've been around since 2005, which is quite a feat in itself. Today, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michelle calder Karras. Dr. Karras is a mental health researcher who is interested in video games and how they can promote mental health and even prevent suicide. Dr. Karras is a gamer herself. Today, Dr. Karras will talk with us about how the games we participate in improve or hinder our well being. She will tell us about problematic gaming, privacy issues, and how gaming disorders overlap with other problematic behaviors. Since Dr. Karras is new to Second Life, I'd like to request that our audience hold their comments and questions until she is done speaking. There will be time for a question and answer at the end of her session. Thank you. Please now welcome Dr. Michelle Karras. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Calder Karras, and I'm a public health researcher who specializes in video games and mental health. I'm really excited to be talking with you all today, and I look forward to your questions, but I'll ask you to bear with me until the end to answer them. Aside from the standard disclaimer that the various organizations I've worked with prefer, I believe in talking about my intellectual conflict of interest. Although I haven't had any financial relationships with the video game industry, I do consider myself a gamer, although not as much lately. I have a disability, bipolar disorder, which I've lived with for about 35 years. And my research is driven by my firsthand experience and my experience as a family member. I have a deep personal connection with games and virtual worlds and how they can both help and hinder mental health. Now, when people talk about games, there's often a lot of disagreement or confusion. 
In this presentation, I'll cast a really wide net and use the term video game to define lots of different types of interactive digital entertainment. So this is not strictly correct. Not, I'm, I'm not going to describe games specifically as the way that we think about them in, in, uh, from a scientific perspective as having rules and a goal. But I'll include things like games that help you to be motivated to exercise, digital board games, virtual worlds or simulations, and gambling type games. So all of these things you see, I am lumping together for the purposes of this presentation as games. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to think of it as games as a form of interactive digital entertainment that has playful elements. Now, my background is in the biomedical sciences, particularly in public health. And unfortunately, from a public health perspective, Video games are often thought of as a negative exposure that leads to health problems. They don't have a good reputation. And this doesn't take into account that people play for different reasons and they have different motivations. And that the way that they interact with games or virtual worlds leads to what we call emergent properties. And that makes it impossible to investigate what we always want to investigate in science and particularly in public health. What is the X that causes Y? And while this is a common problem in public health, like what is the pathology that causes measles or Ebola, so how can we prevent that pathology? It's even harder in games because by their very nature, they change as people interact with them and as we make choices within the games. So thinking of them as a simple exposure doesn't make sense. And our understanding of the effects of games is also limited by the fact that the way people play games occurs within a context. It depends on which games they have access to, who they play with, what other activities they may be giving up, and the impact of that game's context. <laughs> and like we talked about earlier in the panel, the changing pace of technology also makes it hard to keep up, not just from uh, um, trying to understand the social context, but also just the new things that are coming down the line as researchers, especially in public health, if there is something that could affect health, we want to be prepared. We want to know what we can do to ensure the population health. And because technology changes so fast, it's really difficult to figure out how to keep up. In a little over 40 years, we've gone from Pong, a black and white TV-based game, to taking games and virtual environments into the real world, like Pokemon Go or becoming a valued member of an online global community, whether it's in a game or a sim. And video games are wildly popular entertainment. So to compare, last year's Eagles Patriots Super Bowl had over 100 million viewers. And that same year, the 2018 League of Legends World Championship, which was live streamed on Twitch, had 99 million viewers. Some of the more popular video games, such as Fortnite, have 125 million players. PUBG, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, has 400 million players. Almost half of the United States plays regularly. Younger people play more than older ones, 72% of younger people versus about 49% of older people. 90% of teenagers play video games regularly. And we talked earlier about identification. 
About a third of men identify as gamers, but that number is much smaller for women, only about 9%. People play games because they're fun and exciting, and they keep playing because they're engaged. In public health, we talk about the importance of meeting them where they're at. If we want to improve the health of a population or a group of people by giving them some kind of intervention, we can't expect them to come to us. We have to go out into the community. In the olden days, that might have meant on the playground, like where these kids are playing capture the flag. And social interactions at that time were mostly face-to-face. -face. That meant that people had to navigate a lot of difficult situations that favor those who have good social skills or who conform to social norms. This is what Capture the Flag is today. Today, people spend hours a day online or even say they're always connected. Multitasking is the norm. This applies to people all over the globe, not just those countries where most people have access to high-speed broadband. Young kids now are the first generation who'll grow up with the norm of being constantly connected through online communication. A recent survey by the Pew Internet Research Center in the U.S. found that 45% of teens said that they were constantly connected. For all of us, connection combined with a blending of online spaces, entertainment, and marketing, means that many people get their information through online media. And we've learned how easily this information and even popular opinion can be manipulated. Multitasking has become the norm, which has led to concern about how our attention is being divided. The good news is that these vast changes have leveled the playing field in many respects. These online digital spaces make it possible for people to participate in society and meet like-minded others when doing so in real life can be challenging. So if we want to change the health of populations, we need to meet them where they're at, which is online. Now, social interactions are not my area of expertise, as they are Nick's except in how they compare to the requirements and traditions of social interactions in public health programs. Some aspects are the same, but many aspects are different. For example, there are many more ways to have synchronous interactions, communicating at the same time rather than, say, writing a letter. Now we can have private or open conversations in different online settings, have video conferences with multiple forms of media at the same time, and communicate with thousands of people at the same time. We can still have asynchronous online communication through emails, comments, and discussion, but the speed with which information, ideas, opinions, and support can flow is ridiculously different. We also have anonymity and choice. In the real world, there aren't a lot of opportunities to express your different embodiments of yourself. Here, this is one of my favorite uh, pics in the lower right, we have a bunch of video game fans dressed in cosplay costumes. These folks have come to a gaming con or convention called MAGFest to meet with other fans and enjoy the chance to step outside of their usual personas for a few days. And that was me when I got back into video gaming in 2010. I cosplayed as one of the characters in my favorite dance video game. Well, no, that picture isn't exactly me, but yes, I did cosplay. In online worlds, we have a lot more choice. When we talk about health interventions and programs, we talk about scale and direction. How many people can we reach? If we intervene, is it best to do it one-on-one? -on -one, or should we have some kind of program where we do one-to-many, like an emergency alert system? Do we need feedback or reporting from many people to one person or a group, like doctors reporting on new cases of measles, for example, to the public health department? Or is it best to have many people talking to many people, like a support group? 
all of these modes are a lot easier to implement in online settings. Anonymity may be everyone's biggest concern. The anonymity provided by computer-based communications is one of the biggest potential benefits. It can allow people to feel more free to express themselves, to confide, and this can allow people to form close relationships and receive real support. It leads to different types of communities and unique cultures. But that also has a downside. How anonymous are we really? There's no easy answer. I feel like that could be an entirely different presentation. One of the main things I'm hoping you'll take away from this is that commercial video games are so engaging that they can possibly improve our retention in therapy if we use them as interventions. Here's the way I look at it. We have the individual existing in their social context. That's the middle part of that diagram. With their unique life experiences, their states of health, and their health behaviors. The next step to the right, they choose games purposefully. They're not exposed to games. They choose games pur purposefully and enjoy an immersive experience that involves different types of social interactions like teamwork. When people interact with games, this generates data. Some of the data is publicly available. Some, if we were to analyze it, we would need to cooperate with uh, game developers. We can mine that data, and through machine learning, we could figure out how to use the data to identify health conditions and needs even in the moment. Then we can provide health services and interventions in these online settings where people are already spending their time. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But first, Whoops, I wanted to give a brief review of existing game-based interventions. So, making sure, yes, okay. Researchers in North Carolina randomized people with clinical depression into groups. They asked one group to play Bejeweled 3, uh, sorry, Bejeweled, two, three times a week for a month, and the other group to surf a website about depression. The group that played video games had a significant reduction in their depression compared to the group that just learned about depression from a website. Another group of researchers in Sweden are investigating how to use Tetris as a cognitive vaccine to prevent PTSD. So far, they've found that it reduces intrusive thoughts when given to people who've just had a motor vehicle crash or an emergency uh, cesarean section. And I just noticed that I said, when given to people. And that, that kind of reflects my, my public health background. I'm still thinking of giving a game to a person as if it's a therapy. Now, Tetris, is a much simpler game with fewer emergent properties than, for example, Second Life or World of Warcraft. But you can still see where if you give people Tetris, maybe they'll have a very frustrating experience. But maybe that doesn't matter. We don't know that. Games are also effective when given to children who are put in anxiety-provoking situations, like surgery or chemotherapy. They can really help reduce that anxiety. They can also be used in psychotherapy to develop rapport with patients or to learn more about their perspectives or the ways that they cope with things. The simple game of solitaire can be used to monitor cognitive impairment of people with dementia or other forms of cognitive decline. 
by mapping errors and moves in the game to specific cognitive skills. However, there's one problem with these really fascinating studies. So far, they're all very small. Even though these games offer the possibility of being used as therapy at, at a large scale, like the scale of the internet, there haven't been any large clinical trials yet. So we really don't have good confirmation that these could be therapeutic. My personal experience with online gaming, and specifically with belonging to a guild in World of Warcraft, made me interested in how guilds and other online communities could be useful to veterans. I was in a guild called Flis that was run by a veteran, and he really liked to reproduce the militaristic setting that he felt comfortable in. The problem with games and other online settings is that different types of people are drawn to them. And he didn't restrict the guild to veterans or to people who conform to the rules that he had set for the guild. So like we talked about in the panel, people behave in the same types of ways they behave offline. And we had a young teenager who was just being obnoxious. And that got my veteran leader really upset. And the fact that he was so drawn to the benefits of belonging to this guild and that he really appreciated what that militaristic structure gave him made me think about how therapeutic could that be as a transitional space for veterans who are returning from deployment. So a couple of years ago, I worked with a psychologist at a Veterans Affairs Medical Center on a qualitative study of how veterans used video games. We recruited veterans who were being treated for mental health problems or addiction and who played video games for seven or more hours a week, which is about average. The average age of our gamers was about 40. We ended up with uh, 20 individuals. And we asked them questions about their video game play habits, their user experience in the games, and the social dimensions of their gaming. Oh, also about their military experience and their mental health. Like, what draws you to video games? When you're playing, what makes you decide to stop? Have you ever been a member of a guild or a clan? What was that like? How, if at all, do you feel your diagnosis is related to video gaming, either in a positive or a negative way? Has gaming helped you cope with your diagnosis or manage your symptoms? How? And it's interesting, as a researcher, I find that, I don't want to use a cliche, but of course the cliches are what come to mind. Uh, the first speaker, Kali, I believe her name was, she and I ended up taking a similar approach, right? We were both interested in how games could be useful for people who have conditions that they're dealing with. So it's, it's heartening that she and I are both coming from a medical perspective and starting to look at the same research topic. Yes, so I also asked, has gaming caused you any problems related to your diagnosis? Oh, one more important, important point. I had many excellent collaborators on this and Nick Bowman, who just spoke and was on the panel earlier, his partner, Jamie, is a really important part of this and she helped come up with this um, these questions and do the qualitative analysis. We found that some people indeed used games to escape or provide relief from disturbing or uncontrollable negative thoughts 
and feelings. Others used games to develop meaning in their lives through opportunities for leadership or employment, or even through reframing the difficult choices that they had to make, such as in the line of fire. Many found games really important for connecting. And some of this I'm telling you, and I feel like I don't have to tell you guys this, but you know, I, I present my research elsewhere and people who don't understand virtual worlds, they find this amazing and fascinating. For one young man who had severe PTSD, connecting with his Twitch followers was the only way he felt comfortable in social settings. And he really connected through that military, uh, the military aspect of his gaming. Another vet had some difficult decisions to make during his military service. To him, the game Life is Strange resonated strongly because it had a compelling narrative and the ability to control time. Or rewind it, as you see there. It occurs to me that it would be useful to read the slide text, but of course, let me see, I'm gonna, I'm going to try to rotate my view. I know I can do it. So for the veteran with PTSD, the quote from my study is, I've met a bunch of active duty infantry guys online and we play specific combat games together. We all know the lingo and it's awesome. For the gentleman who liked the game Life is Strange, the main part of his comment is, like if you make a decision and your friend got killed, you get to pull it back, make a different decision, and see if they die or not. But the thing that was most striking to me is how people talked about the power of games to get them through the hardest points in their lives. Gamers were using them as tools to refocus or cope when nothing else is available. They kept the mind busy I was so excited because in qualitative research, metaphors can be really important. And I heard two different people talk about idle hands being the devil's workshop. So one individual talked about how games help with refocusing because they give you tools to do these in treatment. But when you're in the midst of all that chaos, you're not thinking about tools. Your brain has the time to stop quivering. Another gentleman said that he tells guys in recovery and guys who have depression, you just can't go to meetings. You just can't take medication. You got to find something to do to fill those spaces. And when you got the time to think of, you know, the devil's workshop. We even found that for some vets, it was an effective way to avoid substance use relapse. One woman wanted to structure games into her day. Now I'm really excited to tell you what some programs and communities just like yours are doing to use video games for mental health and suicide prevention. Stack Up is a nonprofit organization that serves 10,000 veterans nationwide each year through its Discord server. Discord is a chat program that was originally designed for online gamers. They saw a need for mental health support for their members, so they developed the Stack Up Overwatch program, or STOP. STOP provides free, anonymous, private chat with volunteers who are trained in crisis intervention. They connect with those in need to assess suicide risk, discuss problems, brainstorm solutions, and share resources. STOP served 60 people in 2018 and is on target to serve 90 in 2019. I'm happy to say that I'm currently collaborating with them on a grant with the Centers for Disease Control to develop methods for evaluating all of the Stack Up programs. Now the second one, Operation Heal, was an online educational conference held last year for the Veterans Affairs community. 
We had many researchers, clinicians, veterans, and suicide prevention specialists sharing stories of what worked for them, where the research was, and what was still needed. We had clinicians talking about how they used gaming in clinical practice, how video games were useful in mental health recovery, and first-person accounts of how gaming saved lives, as well as perspectives on social media and suicide prevention. I think I'm running a little slow, so let's see. No, you're fine. Just keep on. Okay. We also had grassroots efforts in the online gaming community. And this online setting was a great way for clinicians and veterans to share knowledge and to learn from each other. It leveled the playing field, like we talked about earlier. And tomorrow is another presentation that I'm really excited about. The American Association of Suicidology is a panel tomorrow, Saturday, in Denver, Suicide Prevention in Video Gaming Communities. Sorry, one second. I helped organize this panel with some suicide prevention specialists, and we'll have representatives from organizations that promote mental health in gaming and gamers, including StackUp. They'll talk about how their organizations use or promote games for mental health and crisis intervention. Please consider tuning in. The panel will be live streamed on twitch.tv at the link there. All of this good stuff I'm telling you about video games is not the whole story. We currently have two proposed disorders related to excessive use of video games. When I started researching this, I was convinced that the benefits of games outweighed the problems. I've since learned that a lot of the research on disordered or problematic gaming is not great. But I've also learned that all over the world, a small percentage of people who game or use social media have true problems related to not being able to control their use. Uh, as Tony mentioned in his presentation earlier, the origins of these diagnoses are in boot camps in China. Parents saw their children neglecting responsibilities in school in favor of online games. So some enterprising individuals capitalized on that by coming up with unique but untested treatments. Well-meaning psychiatrists saw this and said, we need to define a disorder so that only the most severe clinical cases would be seen as needing treatment and they would get actual medical care. The problem is that a lot of the concern about excessive playing gets labeled with terms like dopamine hijacking. And there's this thought that games are so inherently pleasurable that everything else becomes meaningless. This has been tested again and again in studies of brain imaging. But again, there's only one small problem. Many activities are inherently rewarding. But I have never seen a study where other pleasurable activities are compared to video gaming with this brain imaging. So who knows how the brain of someone on games compares to that of someone who's listening to music that they love. Uh, another problem is measurement. All of these online spaces and activities are blending together. There's also the problem of researchers, many of whom aren't really familiar with the activities that they study. So a lot of the evidence about what is called gaming disorder is actually from studies that ask questions about internet addiction. And of course, that makes it hard to tell what is what. It's not just the amount of play. Social context and people's overall well-being is really important for the outcomes of playing a lot. So instead of thinking of problematic gaming as a continuum based on time, it's better to see it as linked to groups of people and their characteristics. In one of our studies, we found that groups of adolescent gamers who played for four or more hours a day, the only ones who didn't test higher in depression measure uh, depression symptoms were boys who also communicated a lot online and had a lot of online friends. 
So rather than being about just the person or just the video game, it was a combination of person factors and types of communication that mattered. And this is really important from a statistics perspective, because if you give someone a survey and then you score them from one to 10, you're mixing people who really have problems as a result of their heavy gaming with those who play a lot of games but don't have problems, who are showing healthy engagement. And when you mix people like that, you can wash out any associations between real problematic gaming and the things that you're trying to look at that could be results or could be things that predict it. Another important thing to consider is that we, as we found in our systematic review of studies that took place over time, people move in and out of states of excessive or problematic use. And about half the time, it seems to resolve within a year or two. This doesn't mean it's nothing. A year or two in a child's life is a big deal. A year or two of problematic gaming during a troubled marriage could mean divorce. And another troubling thing is that the mechanics of games and other online spaces are changing. More and more we're seeing gambling mechanisms in games or other persuasive techniques. They're very carefully designed to encourage people to continue to play and to bring their friends with them. So in the debate about whether we're ready for a specific gaming disorder diagnosis, the controversy in the in the scientific field has polarized and devolved into name calling over the last few years. The other thing to keep in mind is that excessive use is subject to self-control and not a lot of researchers are looking at that. In one of our uh, quotes from the study of veterans, I mentioned it in the panel. This veteran said that I have a final two weeks from yesterday. I need to focus on that. It separates the game from real life. I'm sorry, it being subscribing to the game for a month in order to not feel like you have to log in because you can get resources just from paying to subscribe. So he said, it separates the game from real life and says there's no distractions. When I'm studying, I'm not looking down at the taskbar going, let me see if anybody needs me. Oh, that was, sorry. You don't need the ID number seven mail. Tony Van Royen, uh, who presented earlier, and I have been opposed to a disorder for a while, but we're starting to change our minds based on what we're hearing about the clinical need these reports aren't out in the scientific literature yet, so it's a little hard to judge. But I still don't think a diagnosis limited to video games makes sense because of this thing right here, Harmony the sex robot. She is the android head for a sex doll body, and she currently costs about $8,000 just for the head. My concern is what happens when Harmony is affordable to more people? If we decided to target games for a disorder because we think games are the only type of technology that people are really addicted to, how will the people who can't stay away from Harmony get the help they need? There are a lot of challenges to doing this research. First, if we're going to use AI to try to track in-game behavior or to analyze chat, we're gonna run into the big data issue. This is a growing field, but what we know so far is that people from different fields will need to work together to find the best ways to analyze these data. We also have a problem with how we collect all the evidence. So in some fields, there's still a really negative attitude. So if you're a researcher looking to collect all the papers on games, you have to make sure that you include the euphemisms for games like digital interactive rehabilitation technology or virtual reality. We also have to figure out how to take small clinical trials out into the scale of the internet. What do we do to translate the 30 people who play Tetris or Bejeweled into 10,000 people? 
This is going to require a lot of staffing and a lot of money. So researchers and clinicians will have to figure out ways to partner with industry to do that, like this promotion for Starbucks within Pokemon Go. Conflict of interest is, of course, a big problem in health research. We know that from the tobacco industry, big pharma, etc. And ways around it include disclosure of financial relationships, but that might not be enough. There's also unintended consequences of trying to use games for good. And these usually aren't measured in studies, but they need to be. Addiction is only one potential problem. We should also be worried about things like privacy violations, persuasive advertising in games, and gambling mechanisms in games, which are starting to be subject to regulatory control as they sneak in there. Here's my vision of meeting people where they're at. For me, it was always World of Warcraft. Sometimes people in the game need help. We can recruit World of Warcraft players who have depression for a study, then use machine learning on their publicly available data to search for patterns. We can combine the machine learning with questionnaires that are delivered in the game that look like the game's interface so people don't get their immersion broken or too broken. This will help us identify when people need help then to close the circle, we can deliver the help they need where they're at. In this case, standing on a tower in the capital city of Stormwind. My character shown here is not a healer, but with training, she and I could provide good peer support. I'd like to leave you with this thought. The new norm of a hyper-connected reality is already being replaced by mobile augmented reality. This allows people to always be connected but also to integrate these online environments into the real world. And it might help people get out into public to meet people, socialize, and get physical activity, but those benefits won't be equally accessible to all. These fascinating new games will be everywhere, and it might be hard for people to learn to self-regulate amidst all the novelty. And as technologies continue to evolve, we'll also have to evolve new methods to answer these complex public health questions about how we can take advantage of the benefits of video games while minimizing potential problems. I'd just like to take a minute to thank all of these people who've made it possible for me to do this research. I consider myself very, very fortunate. And a special thanks to Gentle Heron for the opportunity to talk to you all here today. Um, please click the box here to get a note card of my references list. Uh, hopefully, we still have time for questions. We do. We have time for a couple of really quick questions, if there are people from the audience, and Luke has one. She says, regarding the point, games are tools for refocusing the mind in veterans with PTSD or suicide ideation. This involves the distraction method. It works while the game is on, but unfortunately, you cannot play a game 24-7. Have you found any long-term persisting benefit from such short-term game therapy? I think one of the things I saw with, this was actually more with the women veterans that we interviewed. They seem to have more of a sense of, when I do this in the game, it gives me some confidence that I can do it in real life. So the idea would be that even though I may not be able to access the tools, if I can do something to distract myself, then I have a little bit of control, a little bit of ability. So therefore, maybe it'll take some time, but I can learn how to do this outside of games. So it's not the game that they're learning, it's the distraction technique they're learning. Yeah, it's a coping technique. Exactly, when, when nothing else works. But over time, you're internalizing, I can use a distraction coping technique. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, the female-male difference was really impressive. Okay, I've got a question. You talked about hearing people, two people talking about the idle hands metaphor. Yes. What are some other metaphors that people have employed to describe their use of games? 
Oh boy, that's a good question. I think I was just so struck by the idle hands one um, that that really became, that was my main takeaway. Uh, I'm sure there were others, but I can't, I can't think of them off the top of my head. Lucky, do you want to pose that as a question? I wasn't sure how you were posing that. Am I, if I, I'm wondering if you mean, what are the implications of this for people who are making games? Is that the question? Well, I'll, I'll assume that that is for now, because that's a really good question. And I'll say that there are two, well, there are three main things, really. Um, one would be to use ethical game design principles to ensure that you're not building in mechanisms that are so persuasive that they make it really hard for people to stop gaming. So build in those natural breaks or other ways that people can learn to self-regulate. The other thing would be to consider how to take advantage of the, the, the social benefits of games. And, you know, some platforms do this from a, you know, for a financial motivation, but there are developers who are interested in developing these beautiful virtual worlds as social spaces. So that's what we want, obviously. Um, and the other thing would be about data. For, for this framework to work, we need access to data. And some platforms allow some access to data. Uh, but it would be nice for developers to be willing to work with researchers so that we can perform uh, studies in our areas of expertise that might be useful for the developers, um, but they would also be useful for us as public health researchers to try to develop these kinds of interventions. And I really hate to, <laughs> once again, cut our discussion short, but we're going to have to give our next presenter a little bit of time. Your research, Michelle, has many applications. You really give us a lot to think about. I'm going to definitely encourage the audience to click the giver box at the base of the podium there to get the note card of your references. And I want to remind the audience that after this break, Dr. Holloway is going to explain how his organization trains mental health professionals to help veterans and their families cope with PTSD using Second Life as the training venue. And at the end of his session, after the Q&A with the audience, we'll get to go see two Second Life sites that he's built to help mental health providers use the most recent research-supported strategies to provide mental health support. So please take a break, audience. Thank our presenters so far, and come back at the top of the hour for another presentation. Thank you, Michelle.